Marcos Colon here with SC Magazine, and we're at Black Hat 2014. I'm joined today by Carl Sigler, who's the Threat Intel Manager at TrustWave. TrustWave recently uh, came out with your TrustWave Global Security Report, and you guys had some really interesting information regarding the back-off POS malware. I know US CERT recently uh, announced the discovery of this, so can you talk a little bit about uh, the malware itself? Sure. It's um, a unique family of malware. Mm -hmm. We discovered it initially as part of an investigation with the US Secret Service back in October of 2013. Uh, since then, we've seen it in four separate forensic cases that we've been involved with. Um, it's kind of typical for a lot of the POS malware that we've seen before. It does memory scrape, scraping, looking for specific credit card numbers in memory. Um, it sends all that data encrypted back to a CNC server on the back end. Um, it, one interesting thing, it has a um, key logging feature uh, that we really haven't seen in a lot of other malware. Uh, I think probably it's due, f it is meant to collect credit card numbers that are entered manually. Maybe if the magnetic stripe is scratched or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. So How does it, um, you, you mentioned the key line. Are there any other uh, things that make it differ from other POS malware out there? Because obviously a lot of it's been coming out in the news now and a lot of these businesses are on alert. And this one uh, it targeted about 600 large and small businesses, right? Correct. 600 businesses in the cases we've been involved with so mm -hmm. far. Now that the uh, indicators of compromise are out there and AV vendors are creating signatures for it, and IDS vendors are creating signatures for it, uh, we'll probably see a lot more uh, come out in the wash uh, in the end of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's unique in the sense that it's not based on any other family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have your Dexter, Alina, they're mm -hmm. very common POS malware right. families. Uh, this one seemed to be brewed by the, or authored by the uh, criminals themselves, um, which is why it evaded uh, antivirus and evaded a lot of signatures um, and was able to stay present for so long without being discovered. And you mentioned a lot of those other uh, malware families out there. Do you foresee a lot of these other ones cropping up, new ones? Yeah, I, I expect we're definitely going to see new malware families like this. They're not that difficult to, to write. Um, there's a lot of open source code out there that they could probably pull from, uh, leaked source code from other malware families. And um, POS malware, it's, it's kind of a low-hanging fruit right now, so we've been seeing quite a bit of it. All right, now, now Carl's going to give us a test run and see how this stuff actually works. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So what I have here are two systems. One system represents sort of a mock POS system. And the other system, this represents the command and control servers that the attackers would be using. So on the uh, mock POS system, the malware is already installed. Uh, the attack vector that the criminals were using were to uh, look for the remote access software that's typically installed on these POS systems uh, for troubleshooting purposes, for technical support. Uh, they found these systems open to the internet with weak passwords. They were able to log in and then dump the malware on the systems. The malware itself installs itself to the application data directory of whatever user was logged in and installs as a uh, executable java.w.exe. So when it's loaded up in memory, if you're looking at your processes, it, it kind of hides itself. It's not something you would typically look for or, or would stand out necessarily. Uh, there's also a backup version of the uh, malware that's encrypted called NSSKRNL or NSS kernel. Um, and this uh, component is used just in case the malware actually gets deleted. So Backoff is constantly monitoring for its own presence in memory. And if it can't find itself, it will go ahead and decrypt this version and copy it back onto the file system for execution. The two features are memory scraping and, let me just go full screen with this, memory scraping and keyboard logging. So on this mock POS system that we have here, if I was just you know, typing in a cashier's ID, and I'll type in some fake number as a cashier ID, and then a password, and log in, all of that data is captured by the malware and then sent back to the, the, uh, control, the control system. Uh, very typical for a lot of the malware that we see like this, but again, the keyboard logging is a little bit unique to the specific malware. Uh, the malware itself communicates with the attacker system about every 60 seconds. Uh, so anything it captured in that 60 second increment, it's gonna package up and then send to the command and control server as part of an HTTP POST command. So all of the traffic leaving the POS systems looks like just web browsing traffic, just HTTP traffic. 
Um, so 60 seconds is a long time to wait for uh, the credentials to pop up. So we'll, we'll, we'll let that sit for a second. But the other thing it does is actually monitor for credit card data. And I'm gonna scan a expired, completely deactivated credit card into the system. Okay. And you can see some of the track information here. So this is my account number. You can see the uh, expiration date and you're also going to be able to see the uh, CVV code that's embedded in the magnetic strip. It didn't get all the track information here, uh, probably a little bit too fast of a swipe. Uh, but this is the type of information that's stored on your credit card magnetic strip. And that's the type of information you're going to see forced over to the system. So you can see I've already gotten my uh, cashier's ID and the fake password that I typed in. And in addition, during that period, it was able to grab that credit card information. Um, this is typical for magnetic stripes. In uh, Europe and the UK, they're using chip and pin, uh, which sort of mitigates some of the damage that could be caused by these types of attacks. Uh, with chip and pin, the actual CVV code that authorizes the uh, transaction changes every single transaction. So by grabbing that specific code, you're not going to be able to clone the card. Uh, that doesn't minimize the damage. I mean, it doesn't necessarily eliminate all damage that can be done. Uh, using the credit card number, using a person's name, I could perform social engineering attacks and potentially uh, uh, perform other types of fraud that wouldn't necessarily be involved in cloning the cards themselves. Okay. The malware maintains persistence by setting a couple of registry keys. You're going to have your typical run key and any uh, executable that's specified there is going to run after every single reboot. And you can see that that Java W file is now part of that run key. So every time we hit reboot, we're going to be rerunning that malware, the Java W back off. But it also is setting a key in uh, the active setup portion of the registry. You'll see Java W there as well. Uh, a lot of administrators are used to looking for the run keys to see if there's anything odd there. Not a lot of administrators are aware that active setup will also provide persistence between reboots for the malware. Um, and we saw the malware itself. Let me go back over to the attacker system. And here you can actually see the communication between the malware and the command and control server. It's a HTTP POST command and it's always going to this path uh, for this version of back off. Uh, win debug slash Upd check, like an update check, PHP, uh, something that might slide underneath the radar. If we look at the full session here, you actually see all of the client server communication. So this is the back off client communicating with the command and control server. And you can see some of the codes that are used. For instance, op2 is one of two codes. There's op1 and op2. Op2 will specify that this packet has data, or this actual session has data for the server. There's an ID. Every single instance of back off has its own unique randomly generated ID. And that ID also goes into the, uh, creating the encryption key that is used to encrypt and decrypt the data itself. You'll see the user logged in to the POS system and the host name of the system itself. Included is also the Windows version. Uh, in this case, they're calling XP Windows version 11. It's probably an internal code they use. And it lets them see sort of what their demographics are. They probably pull trending statistics just like any other small business would. The name of the malware, in this case the version is last, and that's the actual version number 1.56. At the very end of all that, that encrypted blob of data is the actual credit card information and credentials that went across the wire. This is RC4 encrypted using the key generated from the ID and the user ID and host name. Uh, and then it's a uh, base64 encoded to allow it to more properly go over HTTP. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's back off in a nutshell. So what can some of these businesses do to further protect themselves? Well, a lot of the vulnerabilities that were exploited here were just uh, a lack of basic best practices. Um, the initial attack vector was targeting weak passwords on the remote access software. Um, so having stronger credentials on remote access, preferably even two-factor authentication, would have 
completely stop this uh, from initially infecting any of the POS systems. Um, I think also that a lot of organizations should be monitoring uh, what is leaving their networks. Uh, a lot of organizations are really concerned about blocking evil stuff from getting in. They should also be looking at what's exiting the network as well. Um, in this case, seeing that you have a lot of HTTP traffic that is going to some remote server in a remote country that you don't do business with, it should have raised a red flag for people if they were actually monitoring that traffic. What about these? Uh, what about the vendors themselves, the guys that are actually creating this stuff? The vendors need to take responsibility for this. Um, they put remote access software on the POS system so they can do troubleshooting, so they can do upgrades, things like that. And it makes sense. I mean, that, that's why we have technology for that functionality and that ease of use. Uh, but when you are providing remote access to a POS system that is swiping maybe hundreds of credit cards possibly a day, you need to take extra precautions to secure those systems. Um, so making sure that their systems were set up with two-factor authentication making sure that they had firewall rules that would only allow the POS systems to talk back to their IP addresses only, um, would have gone a long way to uh, prevent this or at least mitigate some of the damage that was caused by it. Thanks for that great demo. Again, Carl Sigler, Threat Intel Manager with Trustwave. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And keep in touch with us, guys, because we got a lot coming from Black Hat 2014.